Okay, this is the third video about grading essays using the essay rubric. So like I mentioned in my second video, we're teaching this new genre, the close reading genre. We're assessing proficiency and we're trying to teach and develop writing skills. All these goals converge on the essays. As we mentioned, we'll practice grading some essays together in the fall, but I want to preview the rubric and scoring system with you now to orient you to the kind of work you'll be doing. We worked hard to come up with a system of grading that would meet several criteria. We're looking for a rubric that will accurately uh, and consistently score essays according for the, uh, for the writing proficiency outcomes we're trying to measure. We needed a rubric that created definite, um, straightforward criteria for you to judge as the instructor. And we needed a rubric that had definite values for each category and step so that it could be used in Foxtail, since I know some of you are likely to want to use that tool for your rubric grading. So this is what we have. Uh, the first thing to notice is that the value steps across the top here are letter grade steps, A, B, C, D, and F. So this gives you an intuitive way to sort of approximate what is the relative quality of these categories. Is it an A-level, is an A-level work, C-level work, etc. I also have short phrases here that you can use as a rule of thumb to see if it answers the question in that category. The first category, for instance, is thesis. Is there a thesis statement with a claim and reasoning? And if you can't answer that question with a yes, if it's more of just a basically, then you know you're more in the C territory rather than the B territory, and so on. Um, let's take a look at the categories. There are 10 of them. And I know that's a lot, but what that does is it makes each category a straightforward tenth of the grade. Very straightforward. And I have subcategorized the categories so that you can see the overall scheme. Uh, we have some argument categories that deal with the, the macroscopic structure of the essay and if it's doing the big things well. We have analysis categories, which I'll say a lot more about in a second. Organization on both the global and paragraph level and one category for editing. Uh, the first one I want to comment on is perceptiveness. So the question I have here is, does the essay make interesting connections and illuminate the passage? Uh, one thing that you will see with close reading papers is that it is not uncommon for most students to get to a point where they can make a basically acceptable close reading analysis, but it doesn't necessarily get very ambitious. Ambitious. It doesn't take any interpretive risks. And so this category helps to differentiate the, the paper that really wows you with an insight that you didn't notice before and is filled with good observations versus those that do the basics but don't really notice anything that you haven't, that was, isn't on the surface or isn't just beneath the surface. The development category uh, is fairly specific and it deals with the application section. So you will remember in the close reading assignment, they are asked after their analysis at the end to discuss how it applies, their analysis, their interpretation of the passage applies when putting it back into the whole text, or if how it applies in the real world. And this criteria asks, does the application section follow logically from the analysis? So what I'm asking here is when you look at that essay, let me just blow this up quickly. When you look at that essay, you should see something more or less in big chunks like this. The opening thesis statement, the block quote, the most the body of the uh, essay is the analysis, and then a short paragraph or two at the end extrapolating the application, the implications of, of the analysis. The criteria titled development is asking, did this application section follow sensibly, logically, rationally from the analysis section, or was it just lopped on, then you know that the development category is going to get a lower score. And then we have the analysis categories. Now I will say right off the bat that this is the bread and butter, or I should say the meat and potatoes of the close reading paper. It is where 
uh, the footwork, the fundamentals happen where the rubber meets the road. And if students don't yet get the basic thing, the engine that drives the paper, then this is the section that's going to suffer. So this, these categories apply pretty much specifically to these analysis paragraphs. And you can look at these paragraphs in fine detail to try to answer these questions as precisely as you can and accurately as you can uh, to give a very honest analysis of how they are doing uh, in these categories. To do that, I want to start by looking at a couple examples of students doing the analysis. So here is an example of a student with an A type paper. So here is the A level student jumping right after her block quote into her first paragraph of analysis. One of the first things to be noticed in this passage is Derizowitz's heavy usage of metaphors. He compares the human struggle towards a position of power or success as, quote, a greasy pole, giving the reader a sense of disorder and chaos. The student has a sense of momentum and focus because she jumps right in with a good, strong topic sentence. She's not waiting around. She's diving right in. This paragraph is about metaphors. And then she goes right to her first metaphor, greasy pole, and analyzes it. Now let's compare that to an analysis paragraph from a paper that's around a C. Uh, here is one such paragraph from that student's paper. Within the passage, the author uses many different stylistic techniques to get his point across. The first, and I feel most effective one, was when he repeatedly points out everything that is wrong with what we are doing and how we are no longer capable of things that can help us grow and improve. And then there is a fairly long quote, and the paragraph continues uh, below that. So what you can see here is a few things. One is the student has not jumped right in. She has a more of a warm-up sentence. But this sentence, unfortunately, has nothing to do specifically with this passage. This applies to every passage of every text ever written. Authors use techniques to make points. So this is a kind of throwaway sentence that is not really getting at the analytical point that she's hopefully developing here. So that's all in a better version, an edited version would be gone, and it would be replaced with a strong topic sentence. Now, what is her claim in the paragraph? Well, she's trying to identify something, but she's not able to, she's not getting very precise with it. This is not a language feature, it's a content feature. In other words, she's restating some of the uh, content of the passage rather than describing what the language is doing in the passage and trying to extrapolate interpretive meaning from what the language is doing. So this is a big, this is an important difference in what I call the mode of analysis. In, the, in student A's paper, the mode of analysis was identifying features of the language, the way that the passage is put together in form, and thinking through what the implications of those stylistic choices are. That is describing the language and interpreting the meaning of the language. This is something more like restatement of the author's ideas. And when a student hasn't stepped into the close reading uh, analysis, they, are, they resort to all they can do is rehash, re summarize, rephrase what the, what the author is saying. So when you see that, you know that the student hasn't stepped out of the mode of description or restatement into the mode of interpretation. Um, the phrase I have here in C is at least once. And I think this is a helpful phrase for you as you grade these analysis categories in particular. Is there at least one example in the essay of the student stepping into the mode of analyzing textual features? Or does the entire essay remain in the territory of merely restating the author's point? And if they haven't done it at least once, then it needs to be in D rather than C. All right, so that's... Uh, what I mean by mode is whether they're actually doing the work of close reading uh, in, in an analytical way by describing language features. Quality is the question of whether they're getting what they're saying about the language right. Uh, we saw in student A's paper uh, that she was analyzing metaphors. Well, what would happen if she was calling what is a metaphor 
by the wrong term, for example. Maybe let she would call it something like tone or something. Well, in, in that case, she hasn't gotten uh, a high level of accuracy and precision, but she would be close. So this is the question of this, are the terms correct? How close uh, and, and um, well-defined is the features that are being identified in the passage? The reasoning category asks if the interpretive inferences that are made are logical and connected to the argument. What I mean by that is students will say they will identify a certain feature in the passage, like a metaphor, and they will say that it leads to mean it means X, or it has a certain effect Y. And if the effect or the meaning they're extrapolating from that feature has no logical uh, integrity, if they, if they interpret something that's wildly like disconnected from the feature they're observing, then they aren't going to score very well in this category. So, for example, we had the uh, student who did a very good job identifying the metaphor of the greasy pole, but if she had sort of misread this metaphor or had made a wild claim that it does something that that metaphor really can't do, then that would be um, detracting from her um, in this category of reasoning. And then the fourth category in analysis is sufficiency, and this is the question of whether uh, the student varies the kind of evidence enough to have a kind of breadth of evidence from the passage. Sometimes you will see students, students will repeat the same uh, type of observation over and over. Maybe they'll focus on a word that's repeated, and then in another paragraph, they'll pick out another word and discuss that one, and then they'll finally they'll pick out a third word and pick, discuss that one. And a student that just focuses on the same kind of technique over and over again has less breadth, and therefore the strength of the argument is a little bit weakened by that. So sufficiency it deals with, is the student looking for different kinds of things? If they did a really good job in that annotation step, when they print out and annotate their passage, they should have saw a number of different kinds of patterns, and by just trying to discuss and correlate those patterns, you get a much more interesting and stronger interpretation. So that is sufficiency. And the rest is pretty straightforward essay category type stuff. In organization, I have uh, distinguished between global and paragraphs. And I'll say that one of the things that you'll notice in the close reading paper is that there is a temptation, there's a trap that students can fall into of analyzing the passage by simply going line by line linearly through the passage and talking about the stuff they're seeing. And that is not the optimal uh, organizational pattern for the, for the close reading uh, essay. We want to see essays that uh, have done the preliminary pre-written work of sorting the observations thoughtfully and deliberately into chunks that make sense to make a specific argument. So that's the global organization category. Paragraphs, this category simply asks, are the paragraphs within themselves focused? Do they uh, feel coherent? And the biggest thing we're looking for there is if there is a topic sentence that nicely unifies the paragraph. Lastly, we have one category for editing. And I simply ask there, is the paper edited carefully? We're looking for only a few typos, uh, approximately uh, correct formatting, uh, like the block quote should be formatted according to the instructions, uh, but we are not really looking or grading for grammar and punctuation. And we phrase this category editing, not grammar, which in fact is probably what they are doing, or that is to say, uh, today's writers in 2020 uh, need to focus on editing disciplines and, and strategies much more than they need to focus on grammar and punctuation uh, editing uh, techniques and strategies because most of the students are going to be writing and are writing on software that catches almost all spelling errors and most, of, except for a few cases, it catches most grammatical errors. So we're asking students to turn in clean proofread papers uh, that don't have weird typos, that don't um, have you know the wrong, the wrong word because it autocorrected incorrectly and so forth. These are things that can only be caught through proofreading. Uh, so this is a skill. 
Uh, and it's something we want them to think about, but in the big scheme of things, to be completely transparent and honest, it is not as heavily weighted. Uh, it's important for them to edit, but what's way more important, looking at the overall uh, emphasis on this rubric, is that their argument is strong and their analysis is solid. You should not be afraid to give students C's. Uh, one C is not going to condemn them to failing their portfolio because it's an average of three essays. And uh, so be honest and straightforward in how you answer these questions. Use the phrases in the uh, steps here to answer these questions and uh, give them an honest and uh, transparent evaluation. Okay, now I'm going to briefly describe how you actually use these rubrics. There is two different ways you can use this rubric. You can either use it on Foxtail by clicking the different categories in the Foxtail tool, which you can import from the Master Liba Foxtail page, or you can simply use the rubric manually on paper, so to speak, and calculate the score yourself. First, let's take a look at how it looks in Foxtail. So when using the rubric in Foxtail, uh, you simply will go to the grade button on the assignment and uh, a view that you will be familiar to many of you, you see the student's essay appear on the left and the rubric in the grade panel on the right. Uh, I usually would just toggle to, so that I could see and focus on the reading the essay and then toggle to get the rubric to come up. Uh, now, the rubric in a Foxtail uh, requires that we place um, point values that uh, correspond to the overall averaged value once all the categories are added up. So in order to make the um, A category correspond to an A level, a straight A grade, the math turns out to be 9.5 points for an A, 8.5 points for a B, and so on. Now. The thing to know is that because Foxtail isn't smart enough to realize that we're trying to divide these category points by a total of 100 points, um, and because a 9.5, if you got straight A's, you would only end up with a A, 95 points for 10 categories of 9.5, not 100. Uh, Foxtail will, would divide that by 95 because that's the highest maximum amount of points allowed and therefore it, it throws all the math off. So a student who got um, an 85 would actually get something more like an 86 because we're dividing by 95 not by 100. So to fix that, um, I have put an, the A plus bonus category at the bottom and most of the time you will simply click no points not for not applicable. Uh, but you do have the option for a student who gets all straight A's, who has a really, really strong paper. This is like, uh, we're talking a rare case when they truly are truly writing excellent papers. You can go above a 95 by clicking these bonus categories. But for the vast majority of your students, you just need to click the NA for zero, and that will calculate the grade just by adding up these values. It's automatically calculated for you. If you are using the rubric, uh, on paper, you would probably not appreciate having to add up 9.5, 8.5, 7.5, and so on. So there's a much simpler way you can do it using a 4.0 system of math. We are calling the uh, the A's are four points, the B's are three points, and so on. And you just add up all the numbers for the categories and tabulate it on this uh, grading uh, table. And if the rubric category, the maximum possible points is a 40, and that corresponds to a straight A of a 95. If you get a rubric score of 30, that's a straight B, 85, and so on. So every rubric point uh, just corresponds to a grade point, um, a percentage point, starting from 95, going all the way down to uh, 55 for zero. Uh, and there is one small wrinkle to this, and that is because Foxtail 
because it's just really frustrating. It wants to make our lives difficult. Because the lowest uh, step has to be a point value of zero by rule in Foxtail, not, my, not me, it's them, but if we did that here, uh, it would actually mess up the math. So you have to do what I'm calling the, uh, the zero penalty, and every time a student gets a zero, you have to subtract an additional 5.5 .5 percentage points uh, for each zero that they get. So let's say they get a Rubik's score of 20, that would be a 75, but let's say one of those categories is a zero, so you're gonna subtract five and a half points off of 75 to get 69.5. So that's how you do that, so that it matches what is going on at Foxtail and everything is consistent. Last but not least, I want to show you uh, your options for grading the diagnostic timed right. Now, the wrinkle in uh, Foxtail, of course, because Foxtail likes to make our lives miserable, is that you cannot attach a rubric to a quiz. So how do you grade the diagnostic time right? Let me show you how I like to grade quizzes. So first of all, how to get to a good view of the quizzes, the submitted quizzes, so that um, it isn't super uh, difficult to navigate. So what I do is I click on Diagnostic Time Right, and in the settings wheel, I select Manual Grading, and then it just is going to list as one long page all of the students' um, submitted essays, and there's a box for you to grade them in. Now, there is no rubric that we can attach to a quiz in Foxtail. So are you out of luck? Can you still use the rubric? Yes. Uh, the way to do that is I have created or I will create a blank diagnostic timed right assignment that will be ghosted unless you choose to uh, make it visible because you want to use it underneath the diagnostic timed right quiz. And in the blank diagnostic uh, assignment, they are not going to submit anything. You're just going to use it uh, as a way of giving them a rubric, um, of filling out the rubric. So if I hit grade, then all the students will come up and you can um, either do a split screen kind of situation where you've got on one half of your screen, I've got the diagnostic timed rights and I can read the student's essay and fill out the rubric on the other side of my screen. Or of course you could just have full screen going for each one of these two windows and switch back and forth as you read and grade. But the point is this does this takes out the math for you and the student can just go in and see which rubric categories they got on their diagnostic timed right uh, without having to do anything super difficult or fancy. Showing them in this uh, low stakes first pass where they're strong and where they're gonna have to work because it gives them uh, a good sense of where they're starting and what they need to focus on. Uh, one run-through, rehearsal run-through, that doesn't account or doesn't apply for their portfolio, their milestones, so it's a little bit less stressful. And when they come up to the essay in a few weeks, the first closed reading essay in week four, they will already have experienced uh, uh, what it is that we're asking them to do a little bit. It also allows you to identify any students who might be um, severely below proficiency, and we will be helping to advise those students to enroll concurrently in Writing 111. And the third reason is it gives you, as the instructor, a first go-around uh, real scenario of grading their essays. And I think that will be very beneficial for us as we head into the real, uh, the real thing in week four. So those are all reasons we're doing this. Okay, with that, I think we have covered probably even more than we need. I hope this helps, and I will be uh, seeing you hopefully not too long from now. I'm very excited uh, to get to see you all again. I hope you all have a great summer. Be well.